And we're live in five, four, four three, two, one. Good morning to all our participants. My name is Clifford Pierre, a neurosurgery fellow at the Swedish Neuroscience Institute. And like, I'd like to welcome you to the Cerebrovascular Question and Answer Symposium hosted by the Seattle Science Foundation and the uh, Swedish Neuroscience Institute. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce uh, my former co-fellow, Dr. Alain Orlev, who is currently working as a skull base and cerebrovascular neurosurgeon at Rabin Medical Center in Israel. Uh, Dr. Orlev grew up in Israel and Connecticut and uh, served eight years in the Israeli Air Force as a helicopter uh, pilot and flight instructor. Um, outside of that, in his uh, journey on to medicine, he completed a medical degree at the Sacco Medical Institute at the University of Tel Aviv. Um, he trained as a neurosurgeon at Sheba and Robin Medical Center in Israel. And uh, during training, he had done a research internship at Johns Hopkins uh, Hospital and where he returned for dual clinical fellowships in the cerebrovascular and skull base. Uh, he then went on to do advanced skull base and minimally invasive training fellowship here at Swedish Neuroscience Institute under the tutelage of Dr. Litvak. And uh, his life beyond neurosurgery uh, includes a loving family uh, with, with a wife and three children, as well as uh, tons of travel. And so we're glad he's back from his uh, vacation and he could be with us this morning to talk about decision-making and tools and tips for vascular neurosurgery. Dr. Orlev. Hi, good morning. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks for the introduction. I'll, um, I'll share my screen. Okay, so um, so thanks again. Um, so my name's Alon Orlev. As mentioned, I'm a skull base and cerebrovascular neurosurgeon. I work at Rabin Medical Center in Israel. And I'll be talking about operative decisions in cerebrovascular surgery. Um, so as mentioned, my um, other than being a cerebrovascular and skull base surgeon, I'm a former Black Hawk pilot. Um, and from that, I kind of, uh, I, I started learning about this. And, um, and I'll mention a little bit from both uh, types of fields, which I find very similar in many ways. Um, we tend to make mistakes uh, in our environment, obviously. And not surprisingly, Often when we reflect back on these, we find that we, uh, that we can find reasons for the mistakes um, that we made. Um, and sometimes these mistakes were expected and we, can, and we can actually learn from them. And I've spent a number of years observing, analyzing, studying the decision-making process in this kind of unique and quite similar environment that we have in the cockpit and the operating room. And I created this uh, tool that may assist with decision-making in the operative setting. In this talk, I'll define a little bit our environment, the type of uh, work that we do. I'll list some factors that uh, go into the decision-making, the way we do it. I pre I'll present the decision-making tool that I worked on, and, um, and I'll provide some examples, and I hope this will be of help. So let's uh, start with uh, some history of, uh, so decision-making is a huge field studied mostly by psychologists, economists, political scientists, historians. Um, it, it's shaped by our evolutionary journey, right? Decision-making started when we were hiding in the savannah. And when, when we hear in the savannah something moving, you have to decide whether it's something gonna, that's going to chase you or you want to chase it. Um, but, but we do know that, that decision-making um, through our evolution is overwhelmed with biases and errors. Um, initially, uh, decision-making models were created and they were studied in a sterile in, in, in environment doing different experiments. They were called the classical decision models. And we found doing these, or psychologists found during these, that our decisions are full of flaws and they also called heuristics. So heuristics, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, it's a simple procedure that helps find adequate yet often imperfect answers to difficult questions. It's sort of a rule of thumb that uh, helps us reach decisions uh, using inaccurate assumptions. And we do this all the time. We use these heuristics when we make decisions. Uh, later on, more contemporary studies came about um, that, that 
kind of change in, and we're looking at a different field called naturalistic decision making. And, and they claim that they're, that they're looking at more of a real world decision making process. They assume that many of these biases and heuristics and flaws that we have when we do the sterile experiment are kind of wrinkled out in the appropriate or real world setting. So um, these are, that's kind of like the history of decision making studies. I want to talk a little bit about intuition because that's a huge part of decision making, a huge part of our decision making. So the, the Webster's Dictionary def definition is immediate apprehension or cognition without reasoning or inferring. That's intuition. Uh, we know that there's a, a role for intuition in decision making, but we don't know where and when. We do, it's an unsettled argument between psychologists about how important it is and for what professions and when. So we know that um, for some professions, it's extremely valid. A professional chess player makes a lot of, it, of their uh, choices and decisions based on, on intuition. Aircraft mechanics should probably re rely more on procedure and, uh, than, on, uh, than on intuition. While meteorologists, political scientists, those are, those are professions where intuition uh, doesn't play at all, um, doesn't, doesn't mean anything. So, so a psychologist named Gary Klein, he studied intuition in firefighter commanders. And he found that they tend to evaluate a single option and then to decide, they decide if to go for it or not to go for it. That is a little bit similar to what we do some of the time. Um, Daniel Kahneman, which is a Nobel Prize um, uh, laureate um, that, that, did a, that a lot of the classical decision models came from him, he warned that uh, intuition is an avenue for decision errors. He talked about intuition as part of our biases and our flaws are caused by the intuition that we carry around. Um, uh, Chip and Dan Heath wrote a great book called Decisive, and they wrote that, uh, that intuition is only accurate in domains where it's carefully trained. And we do know this experience enhances intuition, and we'll talk about that a little later again. Both the both the two um, the the two major players, cognitive psychologists that studied and had and argued about their value of intuition, both Kahneman and Klein, who I mentioned, they both agreed that the confidence that people have in their intuition is not a reliable guide to their validity. In their words, Kahneman also said, interestingly. Be warned that your intuition will deliver predictions that are overconfident and too extreme, and you will be inclined to put far too much faith in them. So that's that's a little bit about intuition, and it's something that we use all the time, but we should probably use a little more safely than we do. And, um, and I'll talk a little bit about that. So let's talk about, dive down a little bit about the decisions that we make as cerebrovascular surgeons. Um, the decisions can start as instinctive decisions. When we have an intra-op aneurysm rupture, that's an instinctive decision, and, and we have to fo follow protocols. There are, there are uh, intra-op decisions that we make all the time that we have a little more time for. Um, for example, clip configuration that we want to put on an aneurysm. There are even bigger decisions um, that are the preoperative decisions that we make, which is selecting the surgical approach that we want to take. And then there are the procedural decisions. Those have been studied a lot. Just an example is cerebrovascular surgery for me. Or should I, or should I uh, take on this job? Or should I buy this house? Or should I marry this person? Those are the big procedural decisions. And um, obviously, um, in terms of time constraints, when you look, it's it's from ones that have are very limited to ones that we have no time constraints at all. Intuition plays a huge role. Intuition and experience plays a huge role in the instinctive decisions that we make. For the procedural decisions, it's exactly the opposite. We don't use intuition. We we kind of uh, we look at our different options and try to avoid making intuitive decisions when we make big decisions for our life. And in terms of options, that's an interesting one. And going back to what I mentioned with Gary Klein. He said that the, during instinctive decisions, we tend to measure a single option and we decide whether to go for it or not. While the opposite happens in procedural decisions, that's when we kind of uh, look for alternatives. So interestingly, I found that the top and the bottom one have been studied immensely. And there's a lot of books that talk about procedural decisions and how do you make decisions in your life. Not a lot have been, has been said and done about this middle ground, which is the ground where we live, where we make our, many of our decisions. So let's define that a little bit. So what are these operative decisions as I define them? They're sub-urgent. They're not 
interop rupture. They're, they're the ones that are, that we have more time. We have a few seconds or a few minutes or maybe a few hours to make some of them. They carry high stakes. We have limited and clearly defined options. We have no deferral option. We don't have an option not to decide. Um, and unfortunately, and I'll talk a little more about that, or fortunately, they're commonly judged by their outcome. And um, these are the decisions we make. As I mentioned, they're neither, neither intuitive nor procedural, and they exist in our world, the realm of professional extremists, where individuals in position that call for these repeated suburgent high-risk decisions that we make. So I try to make a model that will help us make a, um, that will help us with this decision making that we need to make. And I wanted it to be quick decision-aiding tool. I used um, Malcolm Gladwell in his great book, uh, Blink, coined um, thin slicing. He talked about dilemmas and he said, said and he tried to um, advise that we thin slice the dilemma, which means reducing a complex situation down to its key elements. And that's what I'm essentially trying to do. Um, I wanted it to be able to be used both, both pre-op to examine the surgical goals and kind of create a plan. I wanted it to, for us to be able to use it intra-op as a quick aid to choose from specific options. I want it to be able to be used as a calculator, yielding some sort of a numeric result um, because this helps us commonly, and I'll show you examples. And lastly, I, I, want, I want it to include objective and subjective factors because we know both of those go into our decision-making that objective ones will reflect data and subjective ones will reflect personal exper expertise. And lastly, it's a personal um, decision aid. Different people will obviously reach different end, different um, conclusions. So this is the model that I kind of created and it has four different parts to it. Um, I, the acronym is ICRM. It has, the first one is, the first part of it is importance or indication for what I'm doing. And uh, the second one is the complexity. The third is the risks. And the fourth is the mitigating factors that reduce the risks. When you look at this uh, graph on the right side of the screen, we see that two of these are objective factors. Importance and risks, and we'll talk about that, are objective. Complexity and mitigating factors are highly subjective factors. And two of them are positive, meaning they add points, and two of them are negative, meaning they reduce points. And if you do a little bit of math of these, if you take the score, if you give each one of them zero to three points, and again, I'll show in a second, and you take the importance minus the complexity and risks and add the mitigating factors, you kind of have the two negatives and two positives, and you get a number. And this number can, is commonly between minus two and two. It's, it can be between zero and six. And that kind of gives you a ball figure of, should I go for it or not, the way I see it. So importance is, um, is large, largely objective and must be based on current scientific literature. Now I'm talking about our pre-operative decision, our pre-op decision on what we want to do. So we should base it on current scientific literature and it should be uh, as judged by our closest colleagues and not by our biggest fans. And that's some, sometimes a problem that we have when we try and decide how important is what I'm doing. We should try and avoid an inside view. Again, I'm, I'm borrowing from Chip and Dan Heath and rather obtain an outside view view. They coined an inside, they talked about inside view as one that draws from information that is inside our spotlight and is based on our personal experience. They said with outside view, on the other hand, it analyzes the larger general picture as assessed by others. And therefore, alternatives must be examined as well. That is when we actually measure, when we do this pre-op, we, we have to measure the importance or the indication for, for this task that I'm taking on or this dilemma. If when we do this intro op, we don't have the time for any of this. And I think there are two key questions. Is this next step necessary? And are there alternatives, simple ones that I can think of that I can choose instead of this? And give it a score between zero and three. Next one is complexity. That is the exact opposite from uh, importance. It's, mo it's, a, it's the most subjective of all the factors in the model. It's entirely shaped by our personal experience and talent. Um, it may be the factor that alters the entire score of the decision model because it's so subjective and very much based on our, on our abilities. It's important for us to understand that we um, often tend to underestimate the complexity and overestimate our ability to deal with uncertain, uncertainties. That's been shown many times. And lastly, simulation and training 
reduces complexity. That has been shown in by numerous authors and, and also by, by many athletes and many other people that take on comp uh, different tasks. The stimulation and training helps a lot to reduce the complexity. Risks, again, this should be an objective factor. Um, it's important to list all the relevant risks and associated with the dilemma. Not the ones that we tell the patient, but the ones we really think that are the relevant risks at hand right now. When we look at this pre-op, we should evaluate the magnitude and, and likelihood of the associate of the risks. And when we do this intra-op, we should try and assign a numeric score that kind of summarizes the risks that are associated with this specific task that I'm going to do right now. Lastly, mitigating factors. This usually consists of a set of actions that offer the response to the risks that I've just that I've just listed. It usually reduces but not eliminates the risks entirely. And similar to complexity, this factor is subjective and shaped by our experience and talent. Because um, the more experience we have, the more mitigating factors we're familiar with, the more tools we have in our arsenal to deal with risks that may show up. So again, this like complexity is largely, um, lar largely subjective. Now, so these are really the four factors that I think go into any decision, four simple factors that go into uh, the decision that break it, thin slice it. And I wanna show you some examples, three of them, um, that are relevant to cerebrovascular surgery. The first one is an easy one. It's a pre-op decision. We have plenty of time. And this is something we struggled with trying to decide how to go about this surgery. And I'll, and I'll tell you about it. This is a 35 year old male copywriter that presented with seizure. Imaging showed the left posterior superior temporal subcortical uh, ICH from what was assumed was a cavernoma. He was discharged with anti-seizure meds and then presented again with another dysphasic event and additional seizures. Because of the anti-seizure meds, he was unable to work obviously as a copywriter. Uh, he, was, he kept saying that he was just slow. And that, and that pushed us towards our decision to proceed with surgery to resect the lesion and the seizure focus. Now, we did not want to resect just the lesion. We wanted to cure this kid from his, um, from his seizures because, um, because that was the main thing that obviously bothered him. So the question is, how much hemocytorin uh, stained white matter should be safely resected? Now, this is the lesion. Um, I think I'll stop and... I'll, and um, yeah. So, so yeah, so there we go. So, um, so we see the lesion and, um, and it's, it's, um, it's at a location that is associated with Wernicke. Uh, we did an fMRI that, which actually showed that, that Wernicke is, um, or the, um, the speech region, the, uh, the receptive speech region is surrounding the lesion completely. And that caused the dilemma. So what should we do? Resecting the lesion, not a big problem. But how much of this of this white matter around the lesion should we resect? And, and that's kind of the dilemma that we knew we were going to face intraoperatively. And we were kind of thinking, pre-op, how can we solve this issue? Or what's going to help us make this make the decision of can I continue or not? So so again, what we did here is we put the, I put this into this uh, decision model. And again, that's a simple one. What's the importance? We want to get seizure control, right? That's the, that's a reason why we're doing the surgery. And I thought that was a two. I thought that was pretty important from zero to three. The complexity it's, is none. Because once you resect the lesion and you're looking at white matter that's hemocytorin stained and you have to decide, am I suctioning it or not? There's no technical complexity to it. Risk is obvious. I would get uh, the risk is a aphasia, which is a risk, which is I thought was a two, because again, the more we take of the white matter, the more the higher the chances we'll uh, get aphasia, and that and and the mitigating factor, the way I saw it, what helped me got to get to the score plus one, which is a which is uh, was to do it in awake. Awake helped me, and and again we had a big argument about this because because many of my colleagues said you don't need to do awake surgery to take out a cavernoma. Um, and and I thought that for the hemocytorin, that that was the reason, and I think and I think this supports that. That's what we ended up doing. We did an awake. We took this, the cavernoma out and block. Then we did subcortical stimulation, and and guy and um and while he was talking, we removed the hemocytorin stained white matter. He had no intraop aphasia, and he had minimal 
uh, post-op dysphagia that resolved by POD3 and his anti-seizure meds that have been uh, tapered post-op, which is great. So this was, I think, this helped us re reach the decision when we thin, once we thin sliced the dilemma and kind of uh, it, it pushed us uh, towards doing this away. I'll give an, uh, my next example is going to be a more difficult one, at least in my thought. This is, um, this is an intra-op decision of a ruptured, uh, and we have a ruptured aneurysm. This is a young man with a, that, uh, that came in with subarachnoid hemorrhage. He had a wide neck distal MCA dissecting aneurysm. And we, de we decided there's no safe endovascular treatment option. Uh, he started off obviously with an angio. This is the aneurysm, pretty nasty looking, distal MCA, uh, wide neck, and, uh, and we thought this was a, a surgical case, which is what we did. So um, I'm gonna show you a little clip of the surgery. I hope this plays well. Uh, Clifford, if it doesn't, please stop me. Um, so, so this is after the dissection. We can see here the MCA. The aneurysm has, now has a suction uh, over it. This, you can see the, there's a distal neck and the proximal neck. In this clip, I have finished dissecting the distal neck. I have not dissected the proximal neck too well yet. And I did have the proximal MCA um, that, that I, uh, I exposed it and have a temporary clip ready for it. I didn't want to put on a temporary clip um, because I, I, if I can, I'd rather uh, not put one on the MCA obviously, for obvious reasons. So, so this is where we're at. This is, uh, um, and, and now I'm starting to dissect the proximal neck and we were not going to be surprised with the overwhelming bleed that we get here. So we get a rupture from the neck, right, right at the crotch where the proximal neck, um, uh, exists. And I took the, the permanent clip that I had prepared and I knew exactly where this rupture is. And I put a clip that helped a bit, not much, not enough. Then I asked for the temporary clip and I placed it on the, on the proximal MCA. Helped, but still not entirely. So I asked for another big clip. I asked the, the nurse, give me the same clip I had before. And I saw the big clip. I didn't want to get out of the, you know, I have this overwhelming hemorrhage. I didn't want to get out of the microscope to change it. So I just grabbed it and placed it. Now I'm placing it over the initial clip. I know kind of where that the tear is right above me and that I haven't clipped the aneurysm completely. And this does the trick. Now I have two clips. Now I can take out the temporary. Temporary was on for, for thankfully a very short time. And, and the bleeding basically stopped with a little bit of uh, surge flow. Um, now I'm just making sure that uh, the proximal side looks okay. And in a second you'll see, I'm looking at where, they, where the edge of these, these long clips are. And I make sure that that's not on the, not, not on, uh, on the vessel. Now I'm stuck. Now this is the dilemma that I'm at. Distal MCA aneurysm, I have one decent clip and one ginormous antenna sticking out of the cortex. And I know that when, I wanna, when I'm going to want to close the dura, I'm going to have a problem that I'm going to be torquing this clip because, again, I have an antenna coming out of, um, uh, out of the cortex. And, and there's many things you can talk about what I did wrong or what I should have done differently, but I want to go specifically to this dilemma because this is, what I was, uh, this is what I was kind of thinking of what should I do now. So, so should the, this long permanent clip be removed or repositioned? So let's look at it again. Um, so the importance, I wanna, um, I wanna avoid torque on the aneurysm or vessel closure. That is the one thing I was worried about. Everything looked okay, but I was worried that when I closed it, when I sutured the door, and especially when I put on the bone, this, this, uh, this clip is gonna be torqued in a way that, that, can, that, can cause, that can cause some pressure on the vessel or even, um, or, or even uh, rupture the aneurysm, even though it wasn't sticking that much, but it was, it, that's the main thing that worried me. And I thought that was a, a too easily. The complexity of moving it is an overwhelming bleeding. I know that when I had this clip off, this bleeding was quite difficult to deal with. And I thought that was a two also. The risk playing around with a, with a permanent clip on a dissecting large aneurysm. I think the risk, the major risk is the aneurysm neck avulsion, which I thought was also a two. And the mitigating factors were not great. Slow clip removal, large suction, replacement clip loaded. These are all things that I think about and have ready when I'm about to make this move. But that's not going to help me too much, with, of course, when I, if I have an avulsion. And it will help me somewhat with the, with the overwhelming bleeding. So 
putting all those together, I get to a, to a minus one, which is um, which is a bit of a problem. It's it's um, it's against removing the clip, and that's what I ended up doing. I ended up actually just I I ended up I opened the clip a tiny bit, very slowly. I immediately got overwhelming bleeding, and I advanced it a tiny bit, maybe a millimeter, and closed it. Made sure everything looked okay. Got out of there. Closed the dura. Closed the bone. Got out of there. Patient did okay. Thankfully, woke up okay. So post-op angio, um, and I'm going to stop it here for a second. Look at this. There's a there's a little V inside the um, the vessel, and it's and what we we looked at, it and it looks like um, the edge of the clip is kind of sitting, and I thought it's torquing. It just kind of bent out and and pressing on the on the vessel, and I think that's some torque that I uh, from from the little movements that I had to put on it as I was uh, closing Dura. So um, was this the right decision or not? Again, we're judged by the outcome, but um, but my decision model was kind of against the way I did it. It came out against mo uh, moving it. it. I ended up not really moving it, just advancing it a little bit. And, and I ended up uh, causing some pressure on the on the vessel. Then the, I mean, on the flip side, the patient did okay. But um, so last, my last one, my last, uh, the last uh, example that I want to show is a is another intra-op decision that we dealt with. This is a central sulcus uh, dural AV, dural AV fistula. It's a 50-year-old uh, male with repeated uh, right parasagittal post-motor uh, ICHs ca causing leg weakness. This happened twice, at least, over a few years. The weakness each time resolved with rehab. Imaging showed this post-motor parasagittal dural AV fistula draining into the superior sagittal sinus. Endovascular uh, embolization was aborted. It deemed too risky because um, even with super selective, they were they were uh, they were hitting um, some vessels that were actually actually on the motor cortex. Um, and then the decision was to go for microsurgery. During surgery, it was the initial parts were easy. We opened it and we found the superficial abnormal fistula vessels, and those were coagulated. But we knew we were not done. Our dilemma was to should we proceed inside the central sulcus to chase an additional fistula point that we knew was deeper within the central sulcus. So we have an intra-op angio that we do. This is a super selective one showing um, showing the um, uh, the fistula. This is also there's the other uh, pre-op uh, one showing exactly what the fistula is. This is when the patient is already placed, obviously in pins and all. Um, so, and so we, again, we started with the easy ones. And then when, once we were done, we were like, well, there's another deep one. Should we go for it or not? So what's the importance of do, of actually chasing the deep one inside the central circus? The importance is to get complete uh, occlusion of the fistula to avoid the risk of really bleeding. And I thought that was a two. Complexity? Absolutely. I think this is a complex problem. Arachnoid dissection of the central circus identifying the fistula, uh, the, fist the fistula's vessel within this deep sulcus compared to all the other vessels that are in there. Risks, bleeding, of course, when you're deep in, in the central sulcus, or getting a stroke. Obviously, if we if we end up taking the a vessel that's actually not part of the fistula or that's, that's, uh, that's supplying some of the motor cortex or draining. And our mitigating factor is careful dissection and to verify that the vessel, vessels uh, are fistula related. I have to say something about these mitigating factors. I gave it a one. It's probably worth a zero. As one of my flight instructors once said, if your solution for the for the for the, your problem or for your mistake is to next time try and do it better, you have no solution at all. Saying, you know, careful dissection as opposed to not, as opposed to what? Doing not a careful dissection. So I didn't really have good mitigating factors other than knowing that this is a problem. So again, so if even if you put it into this decision model and you give uh, one into to the mitigating factors, you're still at a minus one, meaning maybe it's not a great idea or it may be a risky and complex idea to chase a, uh, a fistulous vessel deep in the central sulcus. Again, we wanted to get complete occlusion. Guess what we did? We chased it. So we continued the so-called dissection, bipolar the fistula, encountered, encountered persistent ble intra bleeding. We, uh, but we managed to control it with some coagulation and a lot of irrigation, and we were pretty happy in the end. 
because our intraop uh, angio post when we were done looked awesome. We uh, include the fistula, and we were very happy. Not surprising. Um, patient woke up with uh, okay, but then had the delayed left leg weakness. Two, two to three out of five, and this is what he had, right inside, right in the motor strip. Um, he ended up doing okay. It took a while. Um, he had to go to rehab. He was very weak again on his leg. And then, and once that resolved, but we probably, we probably coagulated some sort of vein that was draining also the, the, uh, the motor cortex. And, and that's why we had this delayed bleeding. That's what we assumed that happened. So, um, so, so those are three, these are three examples that I wanted to show how this, uh, quick decision model that actually takes seconds. If we use it, that can help us the ICRM model. I want to talk about um, these are things we should think about. We should um, we should think about how we alter the ICRM score that we that we got. We should search for interop information that will change the score. If we know that we have a problem and we know what we need in order to to get a lower score on the way or what tools we need, that's a way to change the score and make it more favorable. Uh, we can define interop factors that will reverse the decision. If we get a decision not to do something, but we say, wait, but if we find this and this and the other thing while we're doing the surgery, that will that will make the, the risk much lower, the complexity much lower, and therefore it will change it from a no-go to a go. Um, and, um, and, the, and the other thing is that we should think about, as I mentioned, things that can increase the mitigating factors. Um, if there are different tools that we can use in order to get a safer, um, a safer or less risky uh, dilemma at hand. And we often have those if we think about them in, in advance. I wanna talk a little bit for a second about the limitation of this model, the ICRM model. It, it definitely has confirmation bias. And the confirmation bias is when we logically reassure ourselves of choices we had already made. So try and avoid that. And I also mentioned it had this has some sort of a spotlight effect. Um, and again, Chip and Dan Heath in their book Decisive, they said, and I'm quoting them, when we want something to be true, we tend to spotlight the things that support it. And when we draw conclusions from our spotlighted scenes, we'll congratulate ourselves for our decision. So we should try and avoid that and make sure we're not using the small in order to support things that we have already decided. These decisions like all probably are clouded by emotions. There's a lot of emotion when we make a decision whether to do something or not, whether to take a deep fistula or to leave this patient with a partial fistula open, of course. This model does not replace intuition. Intuition is extremely important, as I mentioned. Um, this model does not replace careful planning. It's rather part of it. It proceeds or follows the planning phase of every of everything that we that we do. I think it must be assessed individually in order to create kind of a personal base rate. What's your personal go or no go score? And I would urge people who want to use this to kind of retrospectively analyze mistakes or, or choices that they made, whether they went good or bad, and kind of put them into this model and say, okay, this is what I did. This is what ended up happening. This is the score I got. Maybe I should have made gone, gone differently or, or this actually this decision model is supporting my, um, my, my decision. Uh, a short word about outcome assessment. Um, we tend to judge our decisions based on their outcomes, just because of the job we're in. Sometimes we have to remember that correct decisions lead to unwanted results. And as we like to say or know or, or maybe try to avoid um, um, appreciating, but luck plays a massive role in determining the outcome of anything that we do. And lastly, is that regression to the mean is inevitable. And each one of us has their own mean and her, their own uh, curve, but um, we have our mean and we have better ones and, and worse outcomes. But um, but as when you look at it, it with time, we often tend to regress toward the mean. That's the way it just is. Um, to conclude, I'll just say that um, there are various decision-making theories that have been developed um, we live in a we live in a unique world of prof we are professional extremists. 
Um, we have to make unique decision uh, decisions constantly that are neither procedural nor intuitive. They're, they're in, in between. I think the ICRM model that I uh, devised is an um, a, that in, it includes four factors, and I think it can be helpful. It's uh, you take importance and co uh, minus complexity and risks, and you add the mitigating factors. And these are things that um, kind of push you or help you decide one way or the other. It's designed to be a guide for both pre and intra op decisions. I think this tool is subjective, of course, contains biases, but I think it can serve as a decision aid framework. I would uh, graciously invite comments uh, in any way. Um, these are some of my these are my references. Um, I'd, I'd be happy to hear any questions and then comments. Again, uh, we thank you, Dr. Orlev, for that uh, great systematic talk uh, with respect to decision making um, and uh, sharing with us the, your tools. Um, and I think it was uh, excellently presented. Uh, I'm going to open the uh, floor for questions, and if not, I have a couple questions of my own. Yeah, uh, really enjoyed that, Alan. Uh, it's it is incredibly hard to get past your intuition. Uh, you, you know, I think your tool is very helpful in that, at least making us pause and and think a little bit. Um, I I myself find it very hard not to manipulate the the decision things to to meet what my maybe conscious or subconscious uh, mind is already has already reached and but the other thing that that I find you, you talked about you know making the correct decision and having a bad outcome what I think I see more often that or maybe it's just my personality is is having a good outcome uh that happened despite some bad decision making uh and and sort of taking credit for the things we get away with and and you know uh thinking we made a good decision or uh patting ourselves on the back for a good outcome that that we maybe don't deserve sometimes um and and that's that to me is a little more insidious uh in in our thinking yeah and and uh i think you know my understanding of what people in your your previous career do in terms of the um, post-flight debrief, you know, that's that's yeah. been integrated in uh, my experience in sort of a cursory way in, in the operative uh, uh, environment. And I, and I really think that is, there is something where there's real opportunity to be a little more uh, candid about the things we did right, the things we did wrong and, and, and the, uh, role that luck uh, or chance played in our in our cases and and, and so that we're not I, uh, unduly influenced by by the the vagaries <laughs> of the situation yeah yeah I I entirely agree I'm gonna read uh, something written by da Daniel Kahneman in thinking fast and slow in one of his books that summarizes what you said while there's often great deal of skill like pl luck plays a more important role in the actual events, than in the telling of it. And the more luck was involved, the less there is to learn. So those were his words. I love that phrase, then in the telling of it. It's it's uh yeah. <laughs> tales, yeah. tales that grow with the telling. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. but yes, absolutely. Debriefing is a major part of um of uh flight. And usually interestingly, you debrief the things that went well and the things that went not well. Um, and um, because there's often a lot to learn from both. And, and again, you have to, uh, of course, there's uh, luck plays a major role. And you have to sometimes think of, did I did things go OK um, because of luck or did things not go well? This, um, uh, the, because, again, because I was I was unlucky, but I did make the right decision. But this is something that we face all the time. But um, but we can't avoid the fact that our decisions are judged by their outcome, by ourselves and by everybody. Um, that's just the role of the work that we do. I guess. I guess what I'm really asking is, is how do you think we could better incorporate that uh, debriefing so that we do sort of acknowledge that? Um, because it is, you know, when we finish the case, maybe maybe you're in a teaching environment, the attending is gone, the residence fellows are closing, and and there never really is sort of a formal sit down and look at cases, you know, especially a routine case. Yeah, is not there isn't. But you know, when, 
Yeah, absolutely. It's I think what I'm makes it easy and what has been adopted. Yeah, what's been adopted in at least in in flight many times when there's a whole group of people doing the same the same type of flight before before you go out you get a part of your mission is you bring back a um and bring back a section showing this part tell us how you did or what you did in this part and that's something that's almost decided in advance and you can go one of two ways you can either decide today I'm going to debrief this part of the case. I'm going to, I'm going to, um, and it may not be the actual most important part. It may be just something that, you know, when you, um, when you start the training, you take the, you take the basic, you kind of take the entire case and you break it into little parts and you say, all right, today we're going to do what we usually do, but we're going to drill down and focus on something that we've decided ahead of time that this is what we're going to drill down and focus on, on how we did it and what we did and what was our thought process and what we did wrong. And it may be very subtle things, things that you can't completely overlook. And 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 um and I think that's and and when you slice it down to the different to almost chronologically to the different sections of of your um of the task of of the case and you and you kind of say in advance this is what I'm going to be drilling into at the post op brief I think that kind of helps learning a lot. The other thing is that uh, the other option is to kind of say in advance at the end of this case. I want to talk about the one thing you learned from this case. Just one thing. And even if you learned seven, choose one thing that we want to talk about. Let's let's sit down for three minutes and talk about the one most important thing that you want to talk about that you learned. And again, it doesn't have to be the, you know, how the clip is placed or which clip was chosen. It can be anything. It can be, uh, let's talk about the decision to put a temp clip or to, um, or, um, and, and I think if you, Create the setting by uh, telling your trainee before 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 you begin. Let's let's talk about something. Choose anything, and let's talk about it, about something important that you learned at the end of this case. I think that kind of creates a setting for this type of learning. You know, that's that's a really great point. The creating the prepared mind. Um, yeah, that's 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 really helpful. Cliff, um, uh, yes, uh, Doctor Orlev. So with the use of current technologies, you know, natural, artificial intelligence, all of that, where do you see that playing a role within the decision-making process in general, according to your model? That is a fascinating problem because A, we don't know, but um, I'll, I'll answer in a, in a kind of a weird way. What's the role of robotics in, in, um, in spine surgery? Some say when you have a good expert that really knows how to put the screws, he doesn't need a robot. That's true. And all of us would like to go to this great expert that knows how to do it. But if there's a robot that has learned thousands of cases and knows the exact answer to where this uh, this um, specific uh, screw should go, then um, then that may be better than the best expert, right? Because the best expert leans on their experience, while um, while this big data, this um, may lean on an endless amount of experience that's been slowly built. So again, we're we're in a world that values experience immensely. But if you are able to take and and some of what we do is an art. And some of the decisions that we have to do to make are intuitive, and some of them are are complex to the point that you can't break them down to an AI type model, at least to my understanding. But some other decisions, like how should we place our hand or in what direction in order to place the screw in it in the best possible trajectory, that may be done better by uh, by the perfect. We may not have yet the perfect robot very accurately every time, but but at least conceptually, if you can take a, a data of endless amount of patients and put it into the robot, then then uh, then a robot can possibly give you a better answer. So, my my understanding is that uh, AI has been looked at, or obviously it's being looked at for military purposes and for dogfights in particular in aircraft. And uh, it's my reports I was reading say that the uh, AI is is uh, 
coming far out better. On top. Yeah. So, yeah. So I think I think we do have to uh, imagine yeah. a world where where we at least have a good uh, information base to feed into the model, so that so that we can advance that and see see uh, benefit from it. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Are there any more questions? I see a couple other uh, panelists on. All right. Well, it was great, great seeing you, Alon, and uh, really enjoyed the talk. I think, I think it's 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 very thought provoking. I think it is an area that it is. that we need to be more uh, conscious of and 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 pay more attention to. So, thanks so much. Thank you so much for having me. It was really yeah. great. Thank thanks you. a lot. Good seeing you. Thank Take you, care. Dr. Orla. Take care. Bye bye.